Hello and welcome to another episode of Tester Speak special feature. And with me on the screen is AP, uh, Aprajita Mathur. She is a, a conference speaker. She has spoken at Star East, Star West. Uh, she has spoken at Test Leadership Congress. She has recently spoken at a Tribal Conf and had a talk at Testflix. So she's, she is a wonderful speaker, a great tester. She has been working and doing some really cool things. We'll get to know her more during the course of this discussion. Welcome, AP, to the show. Thank you for having me, Rajesh. Uh, we were talking about this, right? So I've, this, is, this is our first conversation face-to-face, -face, right? Uh, live in that sense. Uh, and I'm a big fan. Uh, I read your post on LinkedIn about a thing called manual testing. Uh, and it, it stopped me in my tracks, really, because I've been using that word for so long. Uh, and I'm very glad you started it. And I am a big supporter. And I'm, I'm so happy to be here and to connect with you. I am uh, delighted. And uh, what's even more delightful, Aprajita, is, is the fact that you've got rid of your glasses. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm very happy about that. <laughs> because, because, because people uh, will see you on, on YouTube and read uh, and see all your uh, YouTube videos of your conference talks and they'll see, oh, this, this girl used to wear glasses. Where are her glasses? So, <laughs> so this is the new look and uh, I'm glad that uh, with the new look, she is on our show. So thank you so much for giving your time on, um, on a working day uh, in the morning. So it's, it's what... Uh, almost uh, half past nine in the morning for you? Yeah, it's 9.30 in the morning. Yeah. Uh, but I'm really glad to be here and I'll compensate that it's fine. Works work. Uh, yeah, yeah. This is much more fun. Yeah. So uh, tell us more about your story as a tester. How did you get started? Oh, well, um, you know, I've been asked that question before um, and I'll say uh, I was born a tester. Uh, everyone born a test. Everyone is born a tester. Honestly, we just lose it. So um, this realization struck me when I had my son, uh, and uh, when he was about three and a half years old, right? Um, he started to do all these like weird things. Like he'll take a toy and he'll keep, you know, hitting it till the time either the toy gives up or either I give up, right? So he's stress testing me, uh, and he's. Uh, <laughs> Uh, performance testing uh, the toy. So I think all of us are born testers, um, but professionally, it didn't begin until uh, I graduated from college. Um, and uh, I, uh, so I did my engineering in biotechnology. Um, very interesting story about how I got into it, but um, I've always wanted to be in that field from the very, very start. Um, I was the first batch in, uh, back in the day who actually graduated with a degree in biotechnology. So back in the day, you know, when I decided to do it, uh, my mom's a doctor and she was like, why Why don't you just do computer science or, you know, IT or something like, what are you going to do with this? Uh, and I was like, well, I know I don't, I don't want to be a doctor because I've seen the life of a doctor and I love biology. So this is a pretty nice mechanism of staying in between the two. Uh, so when I graduated from my engineering, uh, I wanted to go for a master's um, and I knew where and what, but, you know, wanted to save up a little bit for my education. So, you know, through campus placements, I got into Accenture. I was in Mumbai uh, and they decided to put me as a tester role for, you know, through whatever their classification criteria was. So uh, at that time, it was nothing, you know, I didn't really think much about it. Uh, you know, whether I'm a tester or developer or what, it, like, I never even heard the word to be, to be bluntly honest. But when I started working there, um, I had so much social uh, pressure, right, from my family um, and, like, from my cousins, from other people who have been in uh, software uh, industry, and they were like, what are you doing with your life? You're, you're a tester? And it was like, I don't really understand what you guys are talking about. Like, I, I like doing this. It's really fun. Uh, but it ended right in track there because I, you know, I applied for my master's. I got it. I came here. 
Um, and then I came to the US and did my master's in bioinformatics, uh, got a job. Now the job that I got was uh, in engineering. Uh, so within the field of bioinformatics, that, that is what I wanted to do. Um, and uh, it was, um, they had this um, blended role around engineering and test automation. Mm -hmm. I was supporting uh, test automation uh, at the time at this company. Um, and you know, this kind of, you know, when you're, you, you've seen something before. So from my previous Accenture life, I kind of knew what testing was and know how it was done, what were the basic concepts. Um, so when I got introduced to test automation, it was awesome. I loved it. It was on bi like with biological data sets. It was like, it was a very happy, uh, I, I cannot explain it. It was like the best possible combination of things that I could I could be doing. I was doing testing. I was doing it on biological data sets. I was coding. It was like the the best possible situation for me. Um, and then I reversed back into an engineering role because you know um, someone else came in and took up the test automation. Um, and um, what is so funny is that everybody around me, like socially speaking. Uh, they were very happy that I was in an engineering position. I was working for this company uh, with big name, you know, uh, doing really awesome stuff. But I didn't really enjoy Bridget. It was not something, uh, you know, just the coding and the biological data sets didn't make me happy enough, if that makes sense. So over one and a half years, you know, uh, it actually took me a year and a half to realize that I am like an okay developer, but I'm an awesome tester and I do not want to switch. So I went back uh, and I've never, I've never turned, but I think it needed some self-reflection and a lot of uh, self-confidence because when I was questioned, because I was questioned, right? I was questioned, why are you doing this? This is so stupid. This is not the best career path for you. You know, you're going to do so much better for developer. You know, you've heard that story probably before. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't convinced myself to convince someone else that, you know, my life, my decision stopped, right? So it took me that one and a half year to struck that realization. And I think once it struck me, uh, there's been no looking back. I love it and uh, I wouldn't change it for anything. So, so that's my, that's been my journey. Well, that is uh, incredible, um, you know, uh, to be born to be born tester and you know as you were uh, narrating the story of your son trying to bang the toy <laughs> i was just thinking of what my son does he he is always on a mission to probably try and prove isaac newton wrong because anything he has he drops it okay so drop test is the first thing he does and whatever he you give him and he's been doing this from the time he could grasp something Okay, so from three months or four months, whenever they get that grip, since then he's been doing the same thing. He loves dropping it and then watches what happens. Okay, so whatever you give, whatever uh, state of matter it is, solid, liquid, he will drop it and he'll see what happens to it. Right. Of course, he gets scolded for that. So, <laughs> but then it doesn't matter to him. So everything he has to, probably, you know, he may have a breakthrough down the line, prove Newton wrong somewhere. <laughs> Put him on the moon he low. <laughs> well, until unless he, he studies uh, Newton's uh, law of gravity, maybe he'll keep doing this, it's okay. So yeah, we, we are born testers. You are absolutely right. And and my son also keeps remind me, reminding me of the same thing. Well, uh, so one very interesting aspect of, of the whole thing is you chose uh, or, or you were interested in a field which let you keep your passion alive towards biology and then uh, you know combine it with engineering. So again, why testing out of, out of the various engineering uh, activities that you could possibly do? It makes me very happy. I cannot put it any other way. So like I've done both aspects of this. And uh, I think what testing keeps alive in me, which is why I was so interested in biology in the, in the first place is curiosity. You don't know what you're gonna find, uh, you know, 
I mean, you're just looking around, you know, everything seems normal. And then, ooh, what is that? Why did that happen, right? And you, you go down the rabbit hole of trying to figure out, uh, maybe it's nothing, but it was an observation. It looked something different. So I think just that element of curiosity uh, is what makes uh, the field of testing so fun. It's very innovative if you think about it, right? You have to really innovate uh, how to do certain things. It's not like, okay, right, three functions, this is how you parameterize it, you know, pass it down, it has to be structured this way, you know, this is the best way of doing garbage collection, like, uh, I feel I can be more free, and I can do the same thing in so many different ways, um, and when you meet other folks, you know, other testers, whether they are in the field of biology or not, um, you can draw a lot of parallels, like, I've, uh, you know, in conference, especially like just oral coffee, I've chatted with people and, you know, I'm just talking to them in general. Um, I, I was talking to someone who's in the gaming industry, believe it or not. Um, and we were discussing this problem of uh, regression testing. Uh, and uh, she said something that they use in the gaming industry. And it applies like a 200% for data analysis. And I would have never thought of that. So uh, just how innovatively you can approach a, a problem in the field of testing, I think that's what makes me so interested in it. And, and I love it. Yeah, and, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, when people go to these conferences and talk to other testers, I mean, they may not necessarily be other speakers, but just other testers. You get so many ideas, you know, about, about what you are doing. It's, it's just that, the, the thing that you spoke about, curiosity. It's just that keeping that, that door open and you know, accepting the information that's, that's flowing in. You can process it in, in whichever way you want and implement it in whichever way you want, but it's important to have the doors open. Now, that brings me to my next question. Now, when you... Uh, when you are trying to test something, you, you said that, you know, you do not know uh, what's what's going to happen next or, or there are a few unknowns which you discover. So essentially, uh, the fun in testing, according to you, lies in looking for that, that unknown. So uh, what about situations where you are asked to execute predetermined set of test cases and look for defects. So what do you what do you say to those testers who go down that path? So you know there's nothing wrong in doing that. You know, what you still get information out of that, right? If you have a pre predefined set of test cases and you run them and nothing fails, you know, either your test is just two equal true or <laughs> Or, uh, you know, you know that, you know, at least in this specific situation, you know, we're fine. You get some level of confidence, right? Um, and at, at the end of the day, all of us are working uh, for a company which has, time. every company has time, every project has time. So you need some mechanism of reducing the scope of your curiosity, right? So I would, I would think of this as, uh, you know, I think of that as, okay, I already know that this is more covered than the rest of the area. So let me focus on these areas where I can explore more, right? I think there's nothing wrong in, in doing that. But I also think that um, like, just because a test is not failing doesn't mean like, like I, I actually I'll reframe that. I've, I've heard people say, uh, nothing's wrong with the software, nothing's failing. Um, and like no tests are failing, especially automated tests, like nothing's failing. And I'll say, well, that doesn't mean, mean we have everything automated, right? If, if there's nothing there, it's not going to fail. Yeah. So it doesn't uh, take away the rest of the testing that needs to happen with your application. It just gives you confidence that, okay, the stuff that we wrote, assuming we wrote it correctly, you know, okay, seems to be working with the data that we tested it with. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so the key is, key is, Key to it is the kind of data that you're using. Yeah. Now, uh, you use a lot of data. And your bio 
says fighting cancer with data. Yeah. <laughs> so probably you are the best person, in my opinion, to answer uh, some of the questions around test data. Sure. Okay, and and, and uh, I will give you a, a, a better context to it. Okay, so these days we are all talking about AI and machine learning and everything. So uh, we've also heard of stories recently. There was a story of uh, story in one of the American newspapers about uh, some uh, an AI tool which uh, worked fine when when it was testing. But when it actually went to the hospital, uh, you know, it did miserably, and uh, patients were in a lot of difficulty because of that. So, how do you how what, what do you think of that situation? What do you think is wrong? Well, there, there could be so many things that can be wrong. So let me first. So I I also uh, participate a lot in AI and ML, uh, and so. I, I want to bring, bring some clarity to it. Mm -hmm. I think everybody is really scared of this field, okay? Uh, and I think the reason they are scared is because how it's being projected. And I think it's people are also scared because um, they think it's, it's far ahead than it actually is, right? So AI ML does, it does exist, right? Uh, and it's not that it just came and it just started, right? It's been there for a very long period of time, right? We've used it in, in many different applications before, right? But even today, irrespective, whether you're talking about, you know, something for detection, whether you're talking about you know, test automation, dealing tools, whatever, right? All, all these uh, fun things that you hear, uh, they are not, they are not like, uh, you know, fully grown to a level where they're above human consciousness. So if you would go back and do some research and anyone who's watching there, there's actually some really good, uh, there, there, were, there was a webinar series that I did with uh, Anna from uh, Test Leadership Conference uh, early last year. And the whole reason to do that webinar series was to bring some insights into what is the current state of AI ML. Like, don't be scared of this. thing. It's not at the state, it's not, it's not here. It's really uh, on the ground. It's just taking off. So learn about it. You know, maybe in 10 years from now, 11 years from now, you will start seeing applications that you would test, just like you test web applications now, microservices. Nobody knew about microservices 10 years ago, right? So if you started talking about the blockchain or, you know, all these technologies that are coming, you should just treat it in a very similar fashion, right? Yes. Um, so, so that's the first thing from, from correction perspective. When it comes to humans and when it comes to healthcare, um, an interesting, so there, there are two ways of seeing a human. Uh, and, and in biology, you call it phenotype. Phenotype as in what you can see, right, from physically. And second is genotype. So that is your, your DNA information. Um, and obviously we see differences even between two siblings, you know, as close as you can be related. Yeah. Both physically and you know, or you phenotypically and, and genotypically, you see those differences. So to assume that any software, whether it has AI or not, it does not matter. Whether it has AI or not, until and unless you are testing this thing or developing this thing on a pretty significantly large population, right? Which uh, if in, in terms of testing, you know, you're trying to encompass your boundary values at some mm -hmm. situation uh, and you don't have fixed boundaries in biology. You, know, you kind of have a bell curve where, you know, you would have majority of people kind of fall in this area. You will always have things that you cannot ideally detect, right? right? But if you don't define this peak correctly, you're going to be in trouble. Yeah. But that's also the situation for testing any other application, right? When you test... Uh, Otherwise, you want to test all the, you test all permutation combinations, don't you? Yeah. Right, or you categorize them and say, okay, let's cover this category, let's cover this category, right? So it's very similar concept and it applies to humans as well. The, the challenge is that humans, uh, you know, with humans, depending on what type of application it is, these permutation combinations can be quite extensive. 
which can become very challenging for new testers. Well, so, uh, so yeah, of course, so there is uh, definitely um, a huge number of permutations and combinations that you need to take care of. I mean, let's let's look at COVID, for example. I mean, we, we know that, uh, you know, uh, COVID uh, has severe effects on people with, you know, pre-existing medical conditions. And those pre-existing medical conditions if you're going to make a list, it's going to be really long. Yeah. You don't know what 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 exact conditions the virus is going to hit. So to to do a test, I mean, I mean, hats off to those guys who have come up with the vaccine. But even th even then, when to do a test and cover all those permutations and combinations, it is uh, massive. Okay, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, it's about getting that 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 portion of the curve, you know, grabbing that portion of the curve correctly. That's 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 very important. And I I go back to my question, original question on on test data. Now, how you use your test data is also very important. I mean, I mean, the reason I I, I was giving the example of the hospital. Now the data that was used for all the machine learning uh, algorithms and, and because because machine learning is fully based on the data that you provide to the computer. So, you know, whatever it learned, it learned based on the data that was available. But in the hospital, in the actual cases, the patients had different medical conditions and the algorithm knew nothing about it. So without learning, if you're going to use the same thing Somewhere else, you're going to see failures. It's 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 a common thing. So now, again, you do a lot of analysis with data, and uh, you know, figure out uh, cancer. I mean, that's that's massive. So, how do you go about doing that? How I mean, what is uh, the pattern of 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 data analysis or, or the path of the data analysis that you take? How do you validate that the data itself is correct or not? It's a very good question. So um, in, in the space of genomics, right, it's a constant uh, problem because one, um, and I'm not speaking to my current company, I'm just speaking in general, but the field of genomics, you know, when they do, or, or medical sciences for that fact, right? A lot of the research, you know, most of these things come out of research, right? Someone did some research and, you know, they're like, oh, this is a great idea, let's implement it. Most research is done on Caucasian population. So Caucasian, you know, is considered, you know, European population and some yeah. white population which you consider. And a lot of it is actually white male, okay? And some of these data sets have existed for years, okay? And we continue to use them uh, across the board, right? So I think the first most important thing is to identify what type of patients are you going to uh, analyze, right? Uh, what are the type of characteristics associated with those patients that are required in your data? So if your algorithm doesn't care about gender, for example, like it doesn't matter whether you are female or male, right? Um, then doesn't matter, right, if it's white males, right? Yeah. But if your gender does impact it, then you need to have female participants, right? Um, age can play a role, right, in, in medical sciences. Cancer can, like cancer, for example. Um, Pre-existing conditions can play a role, right? Um, and also lifestyle can play a role, like a person uh, who smokes, Mm -hmm. person doesn't smoke if you're considering lung cancer. So I think it, it's a very broad question, but it really goes back to the fundamental, um, what are you trying to provide to your customers and in the situation of patient, right? That is a fundamental question. And then you walk back, right? Uh, when we're developing these, uh, because these are used in a clinical setting and they're used for uh, either, uh, you know, coming with an outcome, telling a patient they have something or not, right? Um, it becomes even more um, critical for us to be very cautious of what we're doing, right? 
if if I was working, um, you know, no no offense to anyone, but if I'm working on a web application and you know a button's broken, you know, uh, my customers may be upset. But if I tell a cancer patient who doesn't have cancer that they have cancer, that has very different implications, right? Oh, so, yeah. so so in my situation, uh, it, these things, any development activity, any software that's written, any new algorithm that's written, it doesn't go uh, to the hands of patients and for good reasons um, without uh, not just testing the algorithms internally, but then also through you know, uh, different type of validation studies that happen, which actually use real life samples, right? These are, these are samples that we have not analyzed before on our software. And there's good reason to do that. That is exactly to eliminate uh, some of these biases, right? And to demonstrate that uh, this works or it doesn't work, right? And these are the things that this needs to improve. Um, and it's, it's a very important part of development uh, in, in medical sciences clinical validation or uh, analytical validations. Um, and obviously before you go to that, you do your testing, which also includes you know, taking samples. We also simulate data because uh, we know what genetic code looks like uh, and we know what are the challenges that can happen you know, to, based on literature. So we can simulate that data and test with that. But you know, what's so funny is uh, mother nature doesn't work in simulation. So, um, there's always, I've not seen any application ever that I've worked on, whether this was on agriculture or viruses or bacteria or humans, like across the field, that you have something, uh, you have everything covered. You will always find samples, uh, and I say samples because it could be human, non-human, um, that are not ideal for what you created because you never thought about that use case but you know much mother nature did so yeah. uh, there's this you you have to be you have to have some level of hum humility as a engineer that you can try but you're not going to be 100% uh, in the situation you want to be as close to 100% but you're not going to be 100% yeah uh, that 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 is um really insightful and uh, as you were speaking i was trying to draw parallels with other industries because you gave good examples of uh, how it could affect a patient's life at the same time if we look at say the space industry i mean imagine uh, the data being uh, poorly used while developing the next uh, mission to Mars. I mean, instead of Mars, it goes to somewhere, <laughs> somewhere, somewhere else. And uh, the whole mission goes for a toss and billions of dollars are just, uh, you know, gone in vacuum. So uh, imagine that happening. Or imagine uh, that happening in the fintech industry. And the uh, you know, financial industry, you can, I don't know, do you, have you heard of this bug? I think there was, there was this, I don't remember, but um, I remember somebody told me the story that one, at some point, someone, I think it was a mischief that a developer did that they would transfer 0 0.01 of every customer into their account. Like just imagine, right? I'm not gonna go check my bank statement if I'm missing like a cent, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or, or, or a small amount of money. But just imagine what that transaction cost for the person that got that, right? Yeah. So yes, absolutely. These things can really be lurking. And if you're not looking for them, you're not going to find them. And, uh, and there was a story about somebody oh. missing a zero in the calculations uh -huh. somewhere. And, uh, bef and, and before they could realize already 170 million or something was gone. So, wow. So... <laughs> 170 million well please give me that money <laughs> if you have it extra please give it to me <laughs> well so uh, i mean these are these are some things which which tell us the importance of data we might just laugh it off but you know test data management is is one very important aspect now uh, i want to talk to you a little bit about something else that 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 We've spoken about, but I'm more curious to know about it. You have been a huge advocate of, of investing in yourself, 
investing in self. What investment are you talking about? Wow, that's a deep one. So what investment am I talking about? Okay. So um, I'll have to take you back a little bit uh, from story perspective, right? So, you know, I'm, uh, I've, I don't know. So, so from, from cultural perspective, I've done well for myself. I think my, I think my parents are proud of me, uh, you know. Uh, I'm sure they are. I've, you know, gone through, you know, traditional phases of life. You finish your engineering, woo, uh, you, know, you, you get your master's, woo, you. You get a nice job, you're getting a paycheck, you get married, you know, you have children, so on and so forth. So you have this standard life and you're, and you're living it. Um, it wasn't until, uh, so, so this is very personal. I'm very comfortable talking about it now. I wasn't so comfortable talking about it before. But when I had my son, after I had my son, I went through this uh, pretty serious phase of postpartum depression. And uh, when it was very difficult to handle, uh, you know, now I'm fine and everything. But that one and a half years of, of being in that state uh, and coming out of it, the biggest thing that I realized is I, by that time in my life, right, I had not invested much in myself. I've invested in everything else, right? Fine, education, I get it. That's investment in myself, I get it. But um, it's to reach something else, right? Um, and when I mean investment in yourself, it's really things that are personal to you. It's nothing, it, it's not career. It's not, uh, uh, you know, family. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, social foundations. It's, it's not even conferences. It's not, it's not any of this. It's really just yourself. And that might sound really weird, right? If you think about it, you're like, what else is left? Right, so I think the the first aspect of this is to figure out what does that mean to yourself. It took me a very long time uh, to figure that out, um, and now I just make a conscious decision and and spend time on things that is just me. Right, so we were just talking about this. Um, I I spent last four years trying to get my health back on track. I was really suffering on that on that end, um, and I'm you know kind of. I think this year I'm gonna make it, but it's been a very long-term investment, right? The only person that can do this is me. You know, my husband cannot help me with my health. My son cannot help me with my health. Plus, if it is impacted, nobody else is impacted, but they are impacted, but I am the one who's gonna suffer the most, right? Yes. Uh, so so that, that's an example. Other things that I've invested in, and this kind of goes into to professionalism, but uh, I was really scared of speaking, believe it or not. So about five years ago, uh, you know, I started writing goals because, uh, and, and one of the goals was to uh, do a con to one conference talk in the next five years. And I and just did first keynote last year. So I think the personal investment there was to come out of that fear that I cannot speak. Uh, to have conscious and uh, continuous thought process, right? These are all small little things that I have to work on myself before I can get to a speaking stage, actually submit a conference proposal, and then actually have the nerves to go and talk there. Um, and then you actually start enjoying it, which is a different thing. But it, it took a lot of self build up to get there. So that's what I'm talking about when I say investing. Um, and I think all of us should do it. Um, it's very, very important. We're gonna live with ourselves the longest, uh, no matter who else is here or not. And it is very important to be happy with yourself. And it's very important to love yourself, not be critical of yourself. I know I'm not talking about like philosophical things and like, uh, maybe mindfulness and stuff like that. But I, I really believe in it. And I think it's very important that we do that. Yeah. And, and, and those are, those are, those are some, some very important things that you spoke about. And I'll tell you this, that um, a lot of people who are watching this might say, Hey, this is supposed to be a testing discussion. <laughs> what, are you, what are you guys talking about? Talking about investment and things. So I will tell you the whole deal. Why, why I asked Prajita 
about this question. You know, as testers, we uh, are trying to do these cool things, trying to, so to help solve customers' problems and, you know, trying to bring in quality as, as some, a lot of people would say. We're trying to collect information, pass it to the stakeholders. But in doing so, the big question arises, who are you, right? Who am I? Okay, what is it that, that I'm after? What is it that makes me happy? Okay, and, and these small little things like your health or your uh, confidence, like you mentioned, you know, public speaking confidence. It is something which is uh, missing in a lot of people. And I had that problem. Okay, when I did my first uh, public speaking uh, thing back in the sixth grade, okay, I, I reviewed a book called 101 Dalmatians. In school. Oh. In, in school, on the stage, and, and we, uh, we had these, these school uniforms with, you know, they are called half pants <laughs> back in India or shorts, and, and this shirt neatly tucked in. And so people could actually watch my, my legs were shivering. Because I did not have anything. <laughs> the kids, you know, the primary school children used to be in the front row. And behind that, the secondary school uh, children, because it was in the school assembly hall. So this, the, the kids were saying, look, his legs are shivering. And I, and I could hear that from the stage. And I remembered that. And I somehow did that, went through my thing. I went back and my English teacher, she said, well done, I'm proud of you. That's what she said. And those two sentences, they stuck to me. And they stuck to me till uh, I graduated, finished my engineering, and then I said, no, I have to focus on, on public speaking. I remember ma'am's word, and I have to, you know, make her really proud, because that time she said it to encourage me. And uh, I met her last year, uh, I mean, in 2019, uh, as a part of our school's 25 years uh, reunion. So I met her, and I told her that I, I speak in conferences now. And then she says, see, this is what I meant when I said it, I'm proud of you that day, 29, wow. 30 years ago. So that is why investment is important. And if you are thinking that, oh, you are testing and you're finding bugs in, and uh, you are in a happy zone, I can tell you, and AP will vouch for it, that you can be much happier after you have invested in yourself. I agree. So, 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 so audience, if you're listening to this conversation, after you've seen this video, think, what are the areas where you can invest and improve? And thank you, AP, for, for, for such an insightful uh, story. I mean, sharing your own, you know, challenges and sharing your own bit about investing. I, I, I am really thankful that I'm doing this episode with you. Because, oh, because, yeah. because uh, I will tell you, that I have uh, had my own issues of with related to my health. I mean, migraine has been my good friend for many years. It, he just comes and stays with me for as long as he wants, and then he goes. So that's all. That that's the way I look at migraine now. Uh, I have been, uh, you know, in a poor mental state. I don't want to talk about it during this show, but. But it's been a challenge. But, you know, I've always uh, wanted to be happy. And, uh, and I'm doing things which, which, which sort of make me happy. And, and one of the focus areas now is on my health. Because uh, I have a two-year-old at home. And he likes jumping around. And he expects daddy to jump around with him. And if daddy starts grasping for breath after making two jumps, the little guy feels sad about it. So health is something that, <laughs> that I have to take care. Not, not just because my, because I want to play with my son, but because I just want to be, you know, feel better, feel good, you know? So, yeah. So, 
see what you did. You made me. <laughs> first step. Acknowledging is the first step. And it's a pretty big step, actually. You know, just acknowledging that I need to do X or I want to do X. It's, it's a pretty big step. And yay, you're there. Uh, yeah. Next next episode, uh, Rajesh, we're going to do 10 jumping jacks together. Um, okay, we'll do <laughs> if that. You're at two right now, right? That's five times. <laughs> <laughs> we, we'll do that. Okay, so um, this brings me to a very interesting section of my, my Just to Speak interviews, and, and it is rapid fire. So you will have only five seconds to think about an answer to the question. And if okay. it is a multiple choice question. Oh. Okay. If it is a multiple choice question, you have to give the reason for your choice. Okay. Um, you know, it's really hard. And I don't even get a bump, like a coffee bumper or whatever. Right. <laughs> you can take a sip. <laughs> you can take a sip, a little, little uh, dose of sugar for your brain. <laughs> that doesn't take five seconds. <laughs> if, if you really want to do that. Okay. Okay. Uh, first question. Life at your institute in Mesra or life in Bay Area? Any day in Mesra. <laughs> Why? Oh boy, there are so many reasons. Well, uh, I think I have made some lifetime uh friends there. They're more than friends now. Um, and um, even though, you know, they annoy me to my core, I love them to my core as well. So I think I've built relationships there that um, I would not give up for anything. So just for that. I don't remember anything I studied there, just so you know. Uh, but like, I don't remember any of that anymore. None of that stuff sticks. Um, but um, the, the friendships, the relationships, and just the experiences, right? Like the experiences I had during my time there um, would relive them anyway. Well, uh, for those of you who do not know, uh, uh, AP has done her uh, Bachelor's of Technology in, in Bioinformatics uh, or Biotechnology from BIT Mesra. And that's what we are talking about. And now Mesra, if you... Uh, no is a place near uh, Ranchi, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's pretty popular for its uh, hardcore discipline studies and, and produce gems like, like AP herself. But it's uh, popular for students like you. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that, that's, that's one thing. Okay, so the next question, what's your favorite food? Ooh, um, um, uh, believe it or not, I, I love golgape and I can eat them every day. Um, and they're even better if like, you know, some places have like five flavors of water uh, and like different chutneys and like all possible combinations of things you can, you can do with them, uh, golgape. So when was the last time you had golgape? Uh, on Diwali. So it's a, it's oh. a tradition. Um, I make Golga Pays from scratch every year uh, on Diwali. Um, and it's been a long standing tradition after I came to the US because that was a very, like when I came here, you wouldn't get Golga Pays in an Indian store. Uh, so, so you made it yourself? I made it myself because I had to have them. And, you know, I wouldn't go back home for almost a year, year and a half, two years. Uh, now, you know, things are very different. You can get them easily. Uh, but it's just become a tradition. And then there's this another tradition, I don't know, like so in North India, when, when you have a big festival like Diwali, uh, they say, you know, in Hindi, they would say kadhai chadhana, or, you know, you yeah, actually yeah. Uh, make something in oil. Yeah. Now, I don't necessarily know why that is the tradition. So I'm, I, I love like puri and things like that, but I would rather invest in frying the golgapas than, than making uh, <laughs> puri. So it was like my way of, uh, accomplishing both things. Well, so uh, so uh, so I I now know a uh, favorite gold cup destination when I'm in the US. <laughs> yes, yes, come over. I would I would love to. I would love to take some. 
see uh, so i i i keep on speaking to my guests and every time they talk about food and i'm like okay so next invitation to your place <laughs> even 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 um, uh, my my last guest in one of my previous uh, in in the previous episode we were making plans of having uh, you know lunch at some place and, and probably in one of the episodes i may start discussing menus <laughs> <laughs> and people will start wondering with if it's a testing interview or or for a chef <laughs> well, if you ever get all your guests together somewhere then you know we can potluck and we can bring what we that we like yeah and uh, uh, uh menu then uh, brijesh and, and 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 i can be the food critic yeah. <laughs> oh come on no that's not fair <laughs> <laughs> all right uh, so um, who is bo- so you said you raised two boys who's more difficult to manage ah oh, any name my husband that, <laughs> that did not even take 2 seconds to answer well that was that was super i was tired we have all this episode oh my god <laughs> all right now uh, the I'm final i can explain that <laughs> <laughs> the 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 last rapid fire question and this is uh, of course from our field of work okay testing uh, testing in a more agile uh, ground or or uh, traditional testing i mean software development life cycle coding and then following sitting there and waiting for code to arrive and then doing the test which one do you prefer i prefer what works for the team I have seen teams that do amazing in agile. I've seen teams that do amazing in waterfall. Um, I've seen teams that do amazing uh, with like a cross section of both, but applying one to the other may not work at all. So, whatever works for the team, I will use that thing. Yeah, and you make a very good point here. And the reason why I asked you this question is because, you know, we may say that. In fact, I, being an agile advocate, I say. you use agile for everything not just for testing for software development but even at home okay i i, I if if you give me a chance i will use agile everywhere okay even when i go to the grocery store for that also i'll use probably you know i'll make that process agile but then uh, the hard reality is that there are still a lot of teams who under the garb of or or, or under the um the umbrella of agile are doing things in a in a waterfall way okay yeah they do some you know they do things or they say they do things like a daily stand up or they they make a you know a sprint plan or whatever but we know in reality that isn't agile right so uh, so if we force teams to do things in in a certain way it doesn't work and you're absolutely right in saying that uh, you know whatever works best for the team is probably the way to go thank you that was a great answer um uh i was going to ask you but probably i should probably i should ask you this question <laughs> how many conference talks are you going to do this year Oh so this year I'm actually going to do two conferences so not more than 8 this year. And the reason I said not more than 8 is last year it was ridiculous. I do not know the number of talks I did and though that was a great experience uh with covid right and with like uh the parenting situation like for parents parents would understand this so the parenting situation we have work pressure everything that's happening in life um i stopped enjoying uh the aspect of conference talk uh because it became like a drill it became like uh you know i've signed up for this and i need to do this more than oh this is a new topic and i'm going to research it and i'm going to present it and i want to present like the the reason why i started speaking in the first so i'm going to restrict it this year so that i can take that time and invest that in uh, other areas that you know i have identified for myself to work on this year so 
yeah. I, I will tell you, yeah. I will tell you why was I first hesitant in asking about that? Because, you know, um, a lot of times, you know, speakers, they don't want to, to spill the beans on, 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 on how many places you're going to see them. <laughs> but then, oh. uh, but then um, some other, there are some others who take pride in saying that, okay, we've done so many conferences. Well, it is, of course, uh, a good thing. Um, I myself did six talks last year in, in half a year. Okay, till June, nothing. After June, six talks, which was good. But again, like you, I also felt the pressure that it was probably too much because um, there were times, because we were doing it from home and, and the conferences were at times of, you know, you have to do it at the time when the conference is yeah. scheduled. And that may be the exact time when your son wants to play with you. So, so what do you do? Okay, so um, I have disappointed my son a couple of times, more than that, in fact, when um, you know I've turned him down and said, no, let me do this and then I'll meet you 30 minutes later. And then he's made a grumpy face and, <laughs> and gone, and gone uh, upstairs. But then that was, uh, that is something that I want to avoid this year. So like you, I'm also probably going to restrict. I may participate, you know, because at least then you are at least registered. You're listening to a few talks oh, yeah. of your choice. And, Speaking is a very different game than, you know, participating and listening. Yeah. And listening. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm reducing it because I really want to be speaking with my full heart and that it takes a lot of, uh, not so much the speaking part, but just you know, what is the content that you want? You want it to be valuable for your for whoever is listening, right? It's not just talking. So it takes a lot of time, takes a lot of effort. You might have to customize the same talk depending on your audience. You know, people don't relate to the same examples. Like U.S., Europe, India, they're very different places, just from from geography perspective. So um, yeah, I. I Plus, you know, the, it, my, my pressure sense increased so much with Jaysh because last year with COVID, I couldn't just walk up on the stage, sense the audience, you know, crack jokes uh, when needed, when they were not engaged or, you know, uh, you know interact with them in that setting uh, and, and deliver a talk, which is the best part about speaking, right? Like your yep. audience. So even though like the Zoom, you know, Zooms have opened, uh, you know, so much avenue and you can attend so many things, it really took that thing away from speaking. Um, and what it really did was put the limelight on me versus the content of the talk. Yes. Uh, like I'm recording it, right? And now someone's going to replay that thing. And that made me so nervous. It had to be much more perfect uh, than much more aprajita. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I, I remember, you know, recording it and then going back and, oh, and then tweaking it. And it just took me much longer than, you know, engaging and just having that conversation. So um, since it's going to be very similar this year, I don't expect to be, you know, yeah. ended, ending up at a conference. I'm, I'm hoping that I can spend that time uh, preparing for it. Well, for me, uh, the best part about conferences is the opportunity to travel. Yeah, I will. I, I will. Um, I, I, I really like that. And like you said, I mean, getting up on the stage and looking at the audience now here also, even if the conference is live, you don't really know who you are speaking to. Right. There's you don't have faces in front of you. You have to imagine the audience and talk. But having said that, uh, you know, we I mean, I'm pretty much like you uh, when it comes to thinking about you know, picturing the audience and trying to deliver your best. But a lot of people are trying to get into speaking and you know trying to do a lot of things in terms of finding a topic and doing some research and then submitting their proposal for a conference talk. So what are some of the tips that you would like to share with new conference speakers? Because you've been doing doing quite a lot, and 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 you did your uh, first keynote recently. You'll be doing more of that, I know. So, what are some of the tips that you want to share? My biggest tip would be uh, don't reject yourself. 
So I've done this, you know, where I thought of say a topic and I'm like, oh, you know, everybody knows about that. Or, you know, oh, that's easy. Uh, you know, who would want to come and listen about that? So I think self-rejection is um, the biggest enemy. The worst thing that can happen is you're going to submit a talk and they're going to say no. But it's a no anyways if you don't submit it, right? Like, to be honest, if you didn't submit it, it's a no, you're not going there. So imagine what if, what if it wasn't rejected, right? Or they come back and they say, okay, this is a good topic, but we want you to incorporate X, Y, and Z factors. That happens all the time with new speakers, right? I've been on committees where we have seen topics, we really liked it. But we think, you know, it can be better if, you know, they, they come up with some new examples or they add some content, right? Um, and, and that's a good place to start to get feedback. You can even ask for feedback if you submit it, uh, depending on what type of conference you're submitting. Um, you know, if you ask for feedback, committee might come back and give you feedback. So I would say uh, clear your mind, sit, write down, you know, close your mind. This is my way of thinking, close your mind. Close your eyes, uh, you know, clear it, and then start writing everything that you can speak about very clearly. You think you know this thing, right? And those are probably good topics to start with. This is not my idea. There's this person called Dona Sarkar, um, and I attended one of her uh, workshops where she shared this, but it has really worked for me. Um, and a lot of the time, the first things that come to your mind, which are so obvious to you, are not so obvious to other people. So... Take, take a plunge, um, you know, you can hit me up. I'm happy to help people out, uh, especially girls. No, no, I'm not gender biased, but I'll help them out. Uh, so if, if you want help on uh, conference topics, I've helped other speakers uh, just, you know, to, to network, happy to help. So there you go, audience. I mean, I mean, uh, you, you, you are hearing it from the guru herself. And uh, I mean, if she's, she's, she's very happy to help. Uh, you spoke about women, so you are leading the women who test uh, campaign or initiative, or uh, how is that going? How, what is the response that you're getting for that? <laughs> the first response I get is, "Why not men?" <laughs> so, <laughs> I have nothing against men. I I have nothing against men or any other you know, gender fitness people have. Everyone's welcome. Uh, I I do think that. Uh, women uh, have a different type of challenge uh, at workplace. Men have them too, no, nothing against it. And sometimes just talking to other people in the industry helps you more than anything, right? So it's not that you're not capable of doing it or it's not that you need extra support or you know, you know, somebody needs to lift you up. I think it's just being able to talk about your challenges, uh, work, life, family, and actually 95% of the time, it's not work rigid, believe it or not. Like when I speak to uh, you know, girls who are getting into this industry or women who've been in this industry, it revolves around every other aspect of their life, right? Um, and um, one of the best advices that I got from another, another person at a conference was, uh, I was complaining about dishes, uh, believe it or not. Like I was complaining about how much time it takes me to cook and clean, and I wish I could spend that time, you know, doing X, Y, and Z. And so she said, I know you love your planet, but why don't you just get paper plates? Like, just do it once a week. And it was like, oh, oh my God, what an idea. So I didn't get paper plates, but like once a week, you know, um, we will eat pizza or something like that. Doesn't require a lot of, you know, uh, kitchen work, right? And that gives me that one and a half hour that I was looking for. So something as simple as that. So I'm leading it. I think it's it's uh, it's great in the Bay Area. The community is going very slowly, uh, but it's really uh, connecting with people, learning uh, what they're doing, what are their challenges, and and sometimes you can really help someone with something as obvious and simple as these paper plates. So um, happy to connect and happy to help. And men can use paper plates too, just so you know. Uh, <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> no, I, I, I like the idea of, of pizza once a week. <laughs> I was looking at that, uh, you know. Well, uh, so you you know that with with the test chat group, uh, we also have an initiative called Women in Testing, 
and oh, uh, you do? I did not know that actually. Yeah, so we have uh, so we on our YouTube channel we have a series called Women in Testing, and the acronym for that is WIT or W I T, and the I reason like for, and the reason for that is I believe personally I personally believe that women are more wittier than men. I mean. I know, I know men would come, a lot of men would say, I know, <laughs> but, but jokes apart, I, 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 when I thought of women in testing, I said, okay, I, I have the habit of combining words and making hashtags. I, I avoided the hashtag this time, but I still combined the words and made it W-I-T. And uh, that's, a, that's, that's a video series that we have. We've uh, had 26, 27 episodes so far in that series and it's very simple. We give a topic and two or more women come together and they talk about their thoughts on that topic. This is a, a very simple thing. Uh, there have been 53 women who have participated in the whole campaign so far. And out of those 53, at least 40 have been first time speakers. So first time on, on camera, and now they are on YouTube. Okay, so, and, and they are getting views. They are getting plenty of views. Okay, so um, I'm happy that, you know, I am able to contribute this way because I feel that women uh, and their contributions need to be celebrated more. Okay, I mean, I am uh, too small to give women a platform because the entire world is their stage. But at least the least that I can do is to give a platform to them and uh, I'm thankful to my my friends uh, or my co-enablers as I call them at at the test chat for uh, believing in this idea and 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 saying okay let's go with it we are going to bring in some more variations to it uh, and bring more ideas I have some interesting thoughts in my head and soon uh, people will hear more about the initiatives associated with WIT uh, you're going to see some New, new shows coming up. The existing one will continue, but newer variations in that show with more women participants. And uh, this is, you know, the whole test chat group is, is based on the idea of finding your voice and helping others find their voice. So this is our way of, of helping uh, future women leaders find their voice. When you start, you make a start somewhere and then, you know, you get on a public speaking forum, you, you get that confidence, you speak once and then you try and participate in more conferences and then, you know, you are more heard, people know more about you and then you go places. It's, it's, it's very simple. Okay, that's, that's the simple vision that I had. And uh, I'm very happy that, you know, some of the participants, in fact, in fact, one of the speakers, one of the first, First speaker at uh, of WIT, she uh, also spoke at Testflix, which was amazing. So she did her first ever talk at as a part of a W as a part of WIT, and then she appeared in on one of such interviews with me, and then you know that she is a speaker at Testflix, amongst the hundred uh, chosen speakers. So that is the progression that, that uh, her name is Akriti Shukla. Uh, that is the progression that, that you want to see. And that is, uh, you know, that makes me very happy. That makes all of us at the test chat group very happy when we see these things happening. So, you know, when, when I was uh, researching about you and I, I also learned that you lead the, the women who test uh, campaign in Bay Area. I was like, wow, this is cool. So girls, if you are looking for some advice uh, on public speaking, on how to do things, there she is, uh, you know, <laughs> she'll teach you dance also, no problem. I'll, I'll, I'll connect with you, actually. I would, I would love to participate. And um, Oh, now, yes, yes, yes. Awesome. I'm happy to sign up for that. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Prajita, we have been speaking for an hour now. Uh, thank you so much for... Uh, for appearing in the show, you've, you've just been brilliant. But before I let you go, one final question. Oh my. What does a Prajita do when she is not testing? Ah, well, if 
if a Prajita could do something all day, she would sleep. Um, <laughs> but you, you can ask me what I would like to do. You ask me what I do. Uh, I mostly spend time with my family when I'm not teaching. Um, or um, these days I'm into reading uh, books. Uh, I recently started um, autobiography of Yogi. So um, it's been a very interesting book to read because I'm a fiction reader and that's not a fiction book, um, but a lot of concepts that are, you know, seem fictional. So. Yeah, so, so why don't you just go ahead and share the link with me for that book so that our audience can also, you know, get the book for themselves and start reading. It's, you know, whenever my guests talk about a book, we generally share the link with them. So that they can download, sure. download or buy the book or do whatever, uh, and uh, read the book and uh, feel the same pleasure as as my guests do. So, <laughs> so yeah. So awesome, uh, Prajita. It was it was fantastic talking to you. It and, was lovely talking to you as well, and I uh, think we should connect more. Yeah, and and it's uh, it's absolutely unbelievable that we are speaking face to face for the first time. It it didn't feel like that, of course. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah, I mean, it felt as if we've been knowing each other for a long time. I've, I've been your fan and a follower for quite some time. You know, uh, your conference talks. I have, I have heard them so many times. Inspired, you know, gotten ideas from the way you, you presented topics or the content itself has given me a lot of ideas of, of. You know, improving my ways of testing. So it's it's been a learning experience, and uh, I'm very glad that I did this interview with you today. Thank you, and I will say this: thank you for the manual testing uh, stopping me in the tracks. I, I did go back and remove that word from the job descri descriptions I have because I I yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very very happy to to be part of this community, learning so much. Thank you so much, Vijay. You are most welcome. And so, um, I don't know. Um, maybe I'll I'll connect with you and as the brand ambassador for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be fun. <laughs> All right. On that note, uh, I would like to thank you, and uh, you know, uh, I wish you a wonderful day ahead, and uh, and, and and uh, have a wonderful year ahead of you so you know uh, we'll we'll talk soon talk more yes yes we should we should keep connected and and i'll ping you yeah sure take care bye bye